René saw Europe first discovered the human face, the face as the index of its owner's humanity. The artist penetrated the living mask to reach the soul, breathing life into the God-given features, shaping them to their owner's own purpose. Just as uh, the Renaissance, if you look at the locale of the Renaissance, it first occurred in Italy. Similarly, the first efflorescence of artistic endeavors was witnessed in Italy, and Florence to be precise. In fact, it was the princely uh, family of the Medicis, both Cosimo and Lorenzo, who were the patrons or the first patrons of art in Florence. Many a great mind was nurtured by this little enchanting republic, whose spirit still lingers in its grand edifices, narrow streets, and the water of the Arno flowing beneath the medieval bridges. As far as visual art was concerned, there were three discernible influences on visual art. One was the pure classical, the second was the Egyptian, and the third, the Byzantine. Where the pure classical is concerned, it can be further categorized into three subcategories. One is the Greco-Roman, the other the Greco-Egyptian, and the third is the Roman. And all three, along with the three subcategories, contributed to the Renaissance use of space, dimension, scale, theory and human proportions, as well as the innovative use of color, light and shade. Florence produced most of the major figures of the early Renaissance, who brought a new sense of humanity and drama to religious painting. This was to remain a central tradition of Renaissance art, expressing itself in a zealous quest for greater naturalism. If you look at the Renaissance art, then you will see how lifelike the pictures were. Not only the pictures, not only the paintings, but also where sculpture was concerned. And during the Italian Renaissance, we find that the basic metaphysics of human form was merged with the classical theory of proportions. I will cite an example, the example of David again. It's so lifelike that a story goes that Michelangelo thought the statue to be a real one, the statue of real David. And because the statue was not talking to him, he struck a blow, which can still be seen on the knee of David. And there was the synthesis between the rational and the spiritual. There was uh, between divine cosmology and aesthetics. This synthesis or the symbiosis of the sacred and the material assert that all of Italian hum of all the Italian hum humanists, everyone was not an agnostic. The, when we were talking about secular uh, humanism, when we were t talking about the secular aspect of the Renaissance, we sometimes think erroneously that religion lies totally outside the ambit of humanism or, and Renaissance. But that is not true. Because the contents, if you look at the art of the period, you will be able to understand that religion was an integral part of the art forms of this period. The, the 
theory of proportions, let us, let's turn our attention to that, was very fashionable in Renaissance art. Now, we find that uh, Vitruvius, he says that it was the human proportions was something that was found in the buildings of the Renaissance. None of the buildings looked out of proportion, just as the human body is perfect, it's so proportionate. Similarly, the buildings of that era was influenced by the human body and there was a near perfection as far as or, or at least a quest to perfect the buildings, make them proportional in keeping with the proportional human form. first look at Alberti and Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Alberti on his painting, he came up, this is a treatise, for the first time he describes the laws of perspective. And because he was himself a mathematician and an architect. So it is not only, it is not an isolated artistic endeavor, it is actually merging art with the new scientific and mathematical knowledge of that period. The researchers of Alberti and Da Vinci defined the human figure in its full three-dimensional quality. And for the first time, we find Renaissance art to be three-dimensional. It's a complete U-turn from the art of the medieval period, which was two-dimensional. And we find that the medieval art is very stunted, but since uh, Renaissance art was infused with realism. It was infused with the sense of proportion. It was infused with perspectives. We find that the Renaissance art was so lifelike. And what was important in the Renaissance art is this, that there was this respect for the beholder of the art. When the Renaissance artists or painters were drawing and painting, they kept in mind what the actual beholders of the art, what the image that they are going to have, what they are going to see. The second a development which influenced Renaissance art was Ptolemy's geography, brought by Chrysoloris to Florence, and ch which changed forever the conception about the earth. So long the earth was visualized as flat. Now the concept of a spherical earth, a concept which was first propounded by Ptolemy, is it now uh, came to Florence. And there we see that this concept of the spherical earth was achieved through the application of geometric laws and perspective. This also influenced Renaissance art. Now, once the notion of perspective 
was relaunched in Europe, it changed the relation in which the artist stood with his subject. Does the science means the technology of science having any relation with these artists I means these pictures, paintings? And yes, so it's as I told you that you cannot take any event in the Renaissance as an isolated event. The development of anatomical sciences, where you actually know what the size of your hand, what the size of your legs are, and you can measure it. This. That is why if you look at a renaissance painting, the human figure looks like a human figure. It is not stunted, it is not out of proportion, it is not otherworldly, it is so thisworldly. To achieve an illusion of human solidity and three-dimensionality, artists studied anatomy and perspective, in some cases to the point of obsession. Did the Renaissance art completely dis distinguish itself from the medieval art? No, as I told you that uh, the Renaissance cannot be taken as a complete break with the past. The knowledge that medieval art was not lifelike, was not real. Two-dimensional art was something which lacked a lifelike quality. So you learn from the fact that there is something which is not totally right in that kind of art and you try to improve upon that. And this, of course, gives rise to the three-dimensional art. Another very significant aspect of the Renaissance art, where we are talking about a transformation of the artist from a master craftsman into an artist. Because if you look at medieval art, none of the med uh, medieval art was oh, very few, in fact, were signed by the artists. But each and every piece of Renaissance art was signed by the artist. So you have different schools of art. Dif as soon as you looked at a picture, you could make out that this is a picture of either Raphael or Ocello or Titian, whatever it is. If you looked at a particular you know, building, you could make out whether it was uh, designed by Brunelleschi or a Ghibertine. If you looked at sculpture, you could make out whether it was executed by Donatello. So this is the importance where the artists themselves became institutions by themselves. High Renaissance art revolved around three towering figures, Leonardo da Vinci, Michael Angelo and Raphael. Leonardo da Vinci, the oldest in the trial, believed that kindly nature sees to it that you may have something to learn everywhere in the world. The ultimate Renaissance man for Leonardo, no branch of study was foreign. He was the first to discover that blood circulates throughout the body. He also designed the first flying machine. Leonardo's diverse interests left him little time to paint. His fame rests on a handful of masterpieces. When Michelangelo was born, Renaissance was 200 years old and at its peak. In his lifetime that spanned almost a century, he witnessed the ebbing spirit of this movement. Michelangelo is looked upon as a superman who tackled single-handedly the kind of tasks that others approached with teams of assistants, painting the vast ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, carving colossal statues, and directing work 
on the largest church in Christendom. The Sistine Chapel fresco was completed in four years and presents an incredibly complex but philosophically unified composition that fuses traditional Christian theology with Neoplatonic thought. When he was overtaken by death at the age of 89, he was still creating masterpieces. And of course, his work went beyond realism. It was, all the other works could be categorized as uh, uh, the, those arts which replicated realism. Where Michelangelo is concerned, he transcended that. He went beyond realism. Raphael was younger to Michelangelo by almost a generation. But at a young age, he became Michelangelo's rival in his vision and virtuosity. In his large fresco, he brought together Aristotelian and Platonic schools of thought. In each city, you have different schools of art. The Venetian school of art was actually an outgrowth of the Flor uh, Florentine Renaissance style with elements borrowed from the Byzantium. If you look at uh, the location of Venice, its contact with the Byzantium and even further east was much more probable than the rest of uh, Italy. And that is why they, the art that emerged in Venice was actually an art which was an outgrowth of the Florentine art forms as well as the new things that Venice learned from the influence of the Byzantine and even further east. The best example are the rich hues used by Titian in his art. He was uh, working in Venice and intense light paintings of Canaletto. This is this art or the, the, this light painting and the intense use of colors by uh, Titian uh, sort of differentiates Venetian art from the other schools of art. Did it brought any uh, so change in their so, social, uh, social status? Well, you can argue that since most of these artists were patronized by the various uh, merchant houses, they acted according to the dictates of these people. You can argue. But what is important to remember is, in spite of this, the artist had a kind of an independence where if, if he did not have an independence to choose his subject, at least he had the independence to execute the painting the way he wanted to. The use of color, that was not dictated. The use of color, the use of shade, in what perspective he was going to draw it, th this all depended on uh, the choice of the artist. Okay, That was the individualism. And another very interesting uh, thing emerges during this period, that is various city-states competing with one another as far as embellishing their towns with magnificent buildings was concerned. It has been said that uh, this may have been due to their desire to absolve themselves of the sins that they uh, were perpetrating against Catholic Christianity. And what is it? Because if you look at Catholic tenets, then usury and profit is something which is condemned. And where the merchants were concerned, it was this usury and profit on which, you know, they ached a livelihood. So to absolve themselves of the sins, they were building magnificent churches, magnificent monuments. But this is not the, uh, the only truth. There is another side to it. Because each of these, uh, houses, the merchant princes, if you can call them that way. They were competing with one another, vying with one another to uh, make their city the best city in Italy as far as uh, art and architecture is concerned. 
And that is why we, you will find that in Florence, the old cathedral of Santa Repata becomes the Santa Maria del Fiore, a very, very important monument where you find that uh, every important artist in uh, Florence worked in the Sa Santa Maria del Fiore. You have the Brunel uh, Brunelleschi working there, Ghibati working there, Donatello working there. You have Cellini, you have Masaccio, you have a whole host of Florentine artists working in the Santa Maria del Fiore. And each of these artists were working in a particular field. That is, where Donatello is concerned, he did not concern himself with architecture. He was out and out a sculptor. Where Brunelleschi is concerned, he didn't concern himself with painting. He was out and out an architect. Where uh, Cellini is concerned, he concentrated on gold work. Where Masaccio is concerned, he concentrated on frescoes. So you see, it is not only um, individual styles that they developed. They, in fact, perfected a particular stream of art. And they did not venture much into each other's territory. to other Italian cities. Similarly, Renaissance art was not confined to Florence. In fact, the high Renaissance art is not associated with Florence but with Rome. It was under the patronage of the Roman popes, especially Nicholas V, that we find the best architectural, uh, about the best examples of architecture in Rome. You have the beautiful fresco paintings of the Sistine Chapel. You have the endeavor taken by the papacy to rebuild the St. Peter's Church. And this is the, uh, uh, when the whole of Rome witnessed that kind of artistic efflorescence that uh, Florence started, but of course did not reach even close to Rome. Here we find Pope Sixtus IV called the leading painters of his time. Starting from, we have uh, Ghirlandio, Botticelli, Lippi, Perugino, Raphael, Michelangelo, everyone came and uh, they worked in Rome. One artist did not come to Rome. You know who he was? Leonardo da Vinci. Vinci, Vinci did not come to Rome. He, of course, we find that he went over to France and he worked in France to create his beautiful uh, works of all creators beautiful masterpieces. One aspect of the uh, Renaissance art that I would like to talk about is that aspect of art which tried to uh, a sort of uh, hero worship what we call the warlords. And this is, this is a very dark side of the Renaissance where we see that there was adulation of the men of action. These were actually who? The condottieri or the hired mercenaries. They were known for their uh, patriotism, their bravery and their chivalry. And the Renaissance artists tried to uh, draw them, replicate them, represent them in various forms. One example is uh, we find that Mantegna. He was influenced by Donatello and we find that he was the court painter of the warlord of Mantua who was Gonzaga. influence spreading not only to France but to places uh, out, uh, to other places outside Italy, the Flanders. You know Flanders had the Renaissance. And here of course the art in Flanders is actually exemplified by Rembrandt in the 17th century.
many so brought a sense of humanism and drama to religious painting that first manifested in the works of Giotto and saw its culmination in the works of Michelangelo. It's a kind of a, a transitional phase where you learn from the mistakes of the past, you inculcate new things from the antiquity, and you try to apply it to your circumstances to get a better result. So that the art forms are much more lifelike, the art forms, uh, uh, the humanism or the, hu uh, the uh, preponderance of um, human beings is reflected in the art of the period also.